Well, hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne, and it is time for uh, Sunday morning Power Bible Study. We are now in the third Sunday of Easter. Um, the, the season of Easter is a 50-day season. Easter Sunday is the first day. Pentecost Sunday is the 50th day. Every day in between is a Sunday of Easter, or every day in between is a day of Easter. That's why in some traditions it's referred to as the 50 great days or the 50 greatest days, the great 50 days, that's what it is. Um, so May 1st, um, we have a reading from uh, our first lesson is from the book of Acts. Uh, second, uh, our uh, psalm is from Psalm 30. Our second lesson is uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 5, and then we have John 21. Now, usually in the book of Acts, or usually in our first reading, what we get is an Old Testament reading, right? But uh, we're not getting, in during the season of Eastertide, we take advantage, when I say we, I mean the lectionary committee and what they decided on, takes the opportunity to narrate how it was for the early church because typically what we expect from the Old Testament reading is uh, some sort of narrative. Um, and so we get that uh, in the book of Acts. Here we are in chapter nine, introducing the person of Paul. Uh, here he's named Saul because he hasn't had that name changed then yet. Here we go, verse nine, or chapter nine of, of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. <coughs> Excuse me. Interesting. <coughs> um, remember, Acts and Luke were both written by the same writer. Okay? Paul... Um, Luke likes to use the word disciples in describing all of the followers of Jesus. <clears throat> and so it's against the uh, disciples, um, the, uh, the, the, it is the disciples that are, uh, that Paul, against whom Paul is breathing um, threats of murder. And in his going to Damascus, notice it says the synagogues. The synagogues were the place where Christians still were worshiping. Why? Because they were, they were Jewish people who had uh, seen that in Jesus the Messiah had come and, uh, and why should they stop being Jewish, right? And so uh, they were violating, though, uh, the, the custom of the synagogues. And so Paul was doing his job, kind of a henchman, if you will, right? Well... It's on, this, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's on this journey that something big happens, right? So, uh, I, so verse two, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So the way is the, one of the first designations of what Christianity was. Um, it probably comes from the Old Testament reference to the fact that um, it, the, the reference to exile was that, you know, you were going to make a way in the wilderness, right? Remember, that was one of, uh, one of uh, John the Baptist's things, you know, uh, prepare the way of the Lord, okay? The way of the Lord. So, um, this was the easiest and most um, accessible uh, way to refer to it. And um, you don't see much else, but uh, this is the earliest, uh, inter interestingly enough, the earliest designation for the church was the way, okay? Which is to say that it is the path of the Lord, um, yes, through the wilderness, which is an interesting thought in and of itself, but um, any, but if you were found to be a part of the way, what that meant was you weren't following the teaching of that was authorized, okay, in the synagogues, so that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Very dramatic, yes? It kind of reminds you of, if you think about it, um, Jesus heard a voice uh, in his baptism. Um, the disciples that were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration heard a voice. Um, uh, the, the disembodied voice is a good uh, study to look at, like, because a lot of people get messages from the Lord in the Gospels, but how many of them get it that's not conveyed through a body, through a messenger, through a person, right? This is one of those rare ones where it is a voice from heaven, okay? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? So the word Lord is not the covenant name for, for God. It's just curios. It's, uh, um, it could be uh, just a, a term of respect, a term of like, well, if you're being talked to out of the blue, um, who else is I going to be? What are you going to call him? Uh, sir, something. So it's kind of a, in, that, in that vein, right? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. This is considered to be by Paul, a resurrection appearance. Uh, even though he doesn't actually see uh, the Lord, he doesn't actually see the risen Jesus, in, as far as he's concerned, this is an encounter with the resurrected Christ because of the way he is identifying himself. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, interesting, but they saw no one. Um, does that mean that Paul did see someone, but they didn't? Um, interesting. It says they heard the voice. Does that mean that they heard the words or just heard that there was noise? Um, interesting, right? Uh, we don't know exactly what it means they uh, were privy to. This is consistent with things that uh, or experiences that we have where there's theophanies, or there's uh, messages from God like, what is it that the people around, what, what was their experience, right? Um, this is one of those rare occasions where we get a little bit of insight uh, where it says that they, uh, they, were, they stood speechless because they, they heard the voice but saw no one. So it might imply that Saul himself did. Okay, verse eight. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So basically blinded. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Is it possible that this blindness was brought on by having seen the risen Lord, right? Um, it could uh, intimate something like that. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Three days is an interesting thing. Anytime you see three days, we gotta think. You, you, you can't not help but think of the resurrection, okay? The three days is a uh, is, is kind of a um, a trope, if you will, that um, that that keys us into um, this has something to do with the resurrection. Okay, so uh, da, 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 three days uh, he neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision. So here we go again, another vision. It's like, is this considered to be another resurrection appearance, right? Very likely so. Because it says vision. Vision implies seeing something, right? Um, certainly uh, uh, instigated by God, but um, 
it's not what we would hope to see as though like in the resurrection appearances to the disciples where it's like, oh, Jesus was, he stood among them or something like that. But still we have the word vision. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Straight, that's the east-west thoroughfare thorough in the city of Damascus. At this moment, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, okay? Other uh, ancient authorities lack that thing in a vision. It just says, he has, he has seen a man named Athanas uh, An 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 Ananias. So we're just presuming that means in a vision. Um, so we don't know. It's like vision, does that mean dream? Or does that mean something more real, like, uh, like you know, some sort of a, some sort of a, a um, I don't know, a, a premonition or something, right? And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Interesting here, Ananias, we don't know anything about this, this Ananias. Um, why would his hands make any difference, right? But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. Apparently, this Ananias is an early believer, yes? But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So what we find here in uh, what, uh, through what the Lord is telling Ananias is that Paul's life is going to, in some way, uh, parallel, mimic, whatever, the way that uh, the life of Christ. Verse 17. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is interesting. The, the idea that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit, some people talk about, well, is this a conversion experience for Paul or is it a commissioning? And some people will argue, oh, this is a commissioning. Some people say, oh, this is a prophetic call. Some people will say, oh, no, this is definitely a conversion. Well, if he's receiving the Holy Spirit, it kind of, that kind of like says to us, well, that sounds like a conversion. Uh, because a conversion, I mean, you wouldn't need, the, the Holy Spirit would already be there if it weren't a conversion. With the, with the Holy Spirit, doesn't that, does that not in, in and of itself make it? A conversion, okay? Um, interesting to think about, right? And verse 18, and immediately something like scales, again, remember, Luke loves these kinds of metaphorical similes, right? Uh, when the thing about Jesus sweating dr drops like blood, um, when he said that uh, the, the spirit descended on Jesus at his baptism like a dove, okay? Those kind, of, and here we have, uh, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. We don't know what this exactly re refers to, but we have precedent for in uh, Old Testament uh, literature where um, uh, characters who uh, were somehow um, not 100% cooperating, shall we say, uh, had blindness uh, inflicted upon them and then it disappeared once uh, something was uh, come to came to fruition we have that here and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored then he got up and was baptized if that's not a conversion what is it I'm right um, uh, some people say no no it's a commissioning no it's a prophetic call um, sounds like a conversion to me all right and after taking some food, he regained his strength for several days. He was with the disciples in Damascus. It's interesting that prior to this incident, we have not had 
any telling of uh, Christianity spreading to Damascus. Damascus is north of uh, the Galilean region, right? Um, and of course, uh, this Damascus Road experience, which is what we call this, um, is uh, uh, held on to as you know one of those one of those um, key moments in the spread of Christianity to the uh, to the rest of the world. All right, we're moving on. Um, Psalm t uh, thirty. Okay, Psalm thirty is a praise psalm for deliverance. It is something that. Remember, it might remind us of the, uh, the first reading. It might remind us of the experience of Jesus. Remember, this is Eastertide. Um, so let us read it. Psalm 30 in the, in the uh, Book of Common Prayer version, 1979. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let enemies triumph over me. O oh Lord my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O oh Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Oh, sounds a little like a, what you might think Jesus would say, right? Or is it something that Paul uh, could have been thinking in terms of the way he had been gotten the better of in uh, being so adamant about destroying the church. Could that be? Verse four, sing to the Lord, you servants of his. Give thanks for the remembrance of his holiness, for his wrath endures but the twinkling of an eye, his favor for a lifetime. Weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Notice that while I felt secure, is it possible that Paul, this could be describing the experience of Paul in his persecuting the church and his zeal for the law, his zeal for his, uh, his religion, that, that describes a feeling of being secure and it's like he would never be disturbed, but yet in his, uh, but yet in his uh, conversion experience that we just talked about, maybe that was that disturbance. Um, I don't know. It's something you, we, want, we must consider because in the Psalms, what we get are expressions of feelings that happen, that could exist in any character that we incur in Scripture, okay? Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with the Lord, saying, what profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? The word pit is that word for Sheol. The Sheol is not hell. It's simply the underworld, the place where dead people go. Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? This is a common thing that we see in the Psalms. Um, always there's this idea of like, almost like a bargaining, if you will, with God by saying, you know, well, you know, um, you know, you kind of... Uh, um, it'll hurt you, God, a little bit if uh, this happens to me because if I go down, um, you know, people know that I'm with you and so if I go down, you go down with me. This is one of the ways the psalmist that tries to, to do that. We see that a lot, right? Maybe that was the attitude of Paul. Maybe that was the attitude of Jesus. We don't know. Hear, O oh Lord, and have mercy upon me. O oh Lord, be my helper. This is a deliverance a declaration, right? Uh, you have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Could be the experience of Paul, right? Put off my sackcloth, clothed me with joy. Remember, he had been all about, you know, being a bad guy. And now he was all about being the best guy ever, right? Maybe. Um, maybe um, it's a reference to the experience of Christ uh, when you compare the, uh, the, the Gethsemane experience. Uh, mm, if, can you make this uh, pass from me? To uh, the Lord, thy will be done, and then accepting everything. Could be. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing, O Lord my God, 
I will give you thanks forever. Therefore, I mean, that last line, like, that could come out of the mouth of Paul. It could come out of the mouth of uh, the resurrected Lord too, right? So um, that's what our Psalm 30 is. It's a praise for, uh, to God for deliverance. And um, like I said, I encourage us frequently to compare what it might sound like if it was expressed by maybe the Lord, maybe a major character in our first reading. All right, we are moving on. Our second lesson, which usually comes from an epistle, is from the book of Revelation, chapter five, okay? Uh, Revel the book of Revelation does start out as an epistle, right? It starts out as a, a letter. It said, basically said that, and we, we covered that a couple of weeks ago. Letter to the seven churches in, eight, in Asia, right? But here, we are in the, you know, not the middle, but it's toward the beginning of a vision of heaven, okay? And in this vision of heaven, there's a lot of whole... A lot of celestial stuff going on, okay? Um, this, uh, this is uh, before that uh, portion of, um, uh, uh, that, that, that gets into what we might call the scary stuff, right? But in this section, it's just, just, a, it's just four verses, uh, verses 11 to 14 of, of chapter five. Look, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice. Okay, first of all, one of the main features of the vision of the, uh, of the revelator, of the writer, the, the apocalyptist, um, the writer of the book of, John's, uh, the book of John's Revelation, um, is it's, it's, a, it's a huge scene in heaven, right? I saw this, and then I saw this, and then I saw this, right? Um, this is one of those examples of looking and seeing. There's this, there's this, uh, there's this uh, many tableaus that come forth, and there are many other scenes that, that happen that, that describe not so much, okay, this is gonna happen. Like, a lot of people take Revelation, you know, as like uh, some sort of a uh, the, the manuscript for the future, like a, a timeline for what's going to happen. It's really not that. It's not the most profitable thinking of it like that. But what it is designed for is, get this, reassurance to the Christians that were there at that time. This description he's giving is not something like, oh, this is all gonna happen in the future. It's like, no, this is actually the way it is now, okay? The reality that we experience here on earth, that's the illusion. The reality is something much bigger. And that's what revelation, which means to reveal, that's the, the word apocalypse, uh, means to uh, uncover, okay? And so what, they, what he's doing is uncovering and revealing to us what's actually happening in reality in heaven, okay? I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures. The living creatures is like, um, means basically uh, all the creation, um, animals, if you will. And the elders, okay, the elders. Um, we've seen that before. Um, uh, the elders uh, were numbered 24, um, which is an interesting number because there were 12 tribes and there were 12 disciples. And so it seems to indicate the, um, that council uh, around the, uh, God that um, he is most close to. So it's like all of creation and, and mentions when the mentions the elders, it's like um, there's a place for those who uh, have always been, not that they get special blessings, but it's just a reminder that they are definitely not excluded, okay? And by being 24 in number, which we're not told that number here, but it does happen uh, in other places, it tells us that um, it's indeed uh, numbering 
those of the, uh, of the, uh, the first covenant with uh, Israel and the new covenant uh, with, um, uh, with um, Christianity and the 12 disciples as they are representative of the 12 tribes. All right, so they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. This is a talk about how the angels and the, the living creatures. Myriads of myri myriads is like, it, sometimes it's translated like 10,000, okay? Here it's just, uh, we just use the word myriads and myriads of thousands of thousands. Like the idea is just millions and millions, you know, uh, more than you could ever imagine kind of a thing. Singing with full voice, remember they're all around the, the throne and they're singing in praise. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. The lamb is a symbolic reference to uh, the Christ, um, the fact that, and the risen Christ, the one that uh, laid down his life for us, remembering him as the lamb, remembers him as the sacrifice, as the, the, the one that um, uh, lays down their life in order for there to be life for everyone else, okay? So that's what we get in that lamb imagery. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and, get this, under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, whew, Okay, so, um, you know, the ancient cosmogony, you know, is like this globe. It's a, not a globe. It's like a snow globe, if you will, with a flat surface at the bottom and a, and a round thing. And um, outside it, there's all kinds of waters. Below, you know, you have the realm of the dead. And um, when it says that every creature in heaven and on earth and under the, under the earth, okay, the Sheol, the place of the dead, and in the sea, okay, the sea and where the waters were, that was considered to be where all of those sea creatures were and those things that were scary, okay? Um, and all that is in them, everything that has ever been a point of sadness, of weakness, of disappointment, of scaredness, whatever, those things that which we fear the most, they're all now singing together to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. So in the end, what he's saying is that everything, everything that exists, all of creation will give praise to God, right? And then at the very end, and the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. The four living creatures, um, those are the ones that uh, represent, uh, uh, we don't know for sure, uh, but they represent the four directions, if you will, of the east, north, south, east, and west. Some people say that the, 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 four, those, the four living creatures uh, represent like the four gospels, you know, um, one, you know, the eagle, the, the, the human, the, the, the ox, and... Um, Oh, what's it? The lion, okay? Um, uh, those are the four living creatures as they're, as they're demarcated earlier. Um, whether they re represent gospel writers, uh, the, 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 the written witness in terms of scripture, uh, we're not sure. But when the elders fall down and worship, this is a recognition that everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. We know who's Lord, we know who's God, and that's what the emphasis is. So as an Easter text, what this is meant to do is to remind us that this is not just a celebration for us, this is not just a, a, a Christian thing, this is something that the, the, the whole world benefits, the whole world, regard, even, even the created uh, order that uh, the, the non-sentient beings, okay, uh, 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 recognize it. So the victory that is represented in the Easter resurrection is something to be celebrated throughout. Okay, we're moving on to the gospel now. Now, ever since Easter Sunday, we've been in John's gospel. And this is the third of three continuous weeks that we've had from the end of John's gospel. We had the resurrection appearance to Mary. We had the resurrection appearance to 
um, the, the disciples and, uh, and Thomas. Here is chapter 21. And chapter 21 kind of feels, if you're to read the Gospel of John all the way through, it kind of feels a little bit like an epilogue, okay? It kind of feels like, wait a second, it really seems like the story was over at the end of chapter 20. But then we have this story in chapter 21. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias is another name for the Sea of Galilee. In fact, I think it's called the Sea of Tiberias to this day, I think. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, remember those were uh, James and John, and two, other, uh, two others of his disciples. Remember, uh, Simon Peter did have a brother named Andrew. Maybe he was one of them. But um, so we have how many? Like one, two, three, four, five, six. So seven of the 12 were there. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Now, I don't think that this is a, ne a declaration of, um, of like, well, ain't got nothing else to do. Let's go fishing. No, I think he's like, um, okay, it's time to get back to work. All right? It's time to get back to work. Remember what had happened. Remember what had happened, especially with Simon Peter, right? He had denied Jesus, right? Um, he said he wouldn't, and he did. He is, we have not yet had any reconciliation. This, spoiler alert, is a scene of reconciliation. Okay, I'm going fishing. They said to him, well, we will go with you. So it's like, oh, back to business as usual, right? Nothing special going on here. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. This kind of sounds familiar. We've had stories of the fishermen of Jesus um, uh, earlier in our synoptic gospels, uh, where they, uh, there was, we, we call it the, um, the, um, uh, the miracle or the, the sign of the deed of, uh, the miraculous catch, the, the, the fishes. Um, this seems to be some sort of recasting of that. Look at this. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. Notice it doesn't say anything about Jesus prior to this. It just says, just after daybreak, eh, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. It's a film. This is a, this is a motif, yeah, where the physical appearance of Jesus typically does not immediately inspire recognition, okay? Jesus said to them, children, interesting, right? Children, children, interesting kind of thing to call them, right? Children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. It still doesn't say anything about the fact that they might recognize. All it is is like, eh, some wise guy on the shore is saying, you know, hey, you haven't got any fish. <laughs> Sucks to be you, something like that. He said to them, well, <clears throat> cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, this is a euphemism for John, who we see frequently in John's gospel, the self-referential thing. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. It's not uncommon in the Gospel of John for John, this unnamed circumlocution referred to as, you know, beloved, the beloved disciple, the one who loved, the one Jesus loved, to be better at recognizing, earlier recognizing, this is the way it was at the, at the tomb, this is the way it is here. It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. Apparently, you don't want to swim naked. I don't know. Anyway, um, but the other disciples came in the boat, 
But, but, but the other disciples came in the boat. Dr they came, okay, it's, it's like came to the shore in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about 100 yards off. So here's this miraculous catch of fish, right? When we have the miraculous catch, that's my word, not the gospels, um, uh, catch of uh, the fish in, uh, in the, the synoptic gospels, it provokes faith. Um, remember how um, Peter responds, you know, oh, my Lord and my God. Um, and it's like Peter has a recognition of who Jesus is from uh, this event. There's going to be recognition, but it's a different kind of recognition here. Look at this. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread, which is interesting because if you think about it, what does that mean? And Jesus cooked for them, right? Because they weren't there yet. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. That's interesting. That's the first time we get any reference to the size of the fish, right? Full of large fish, 153 of them. Number 153, very curious. Um, um, it could just mean a lot of times when we get some details, it's not a symbolic number. It's just simply um, a number that indicates, well, that's how many there were. Yeah. And though, the, and, it, and I think sometimes that might testify to uh, the authenticity of the story, okay? And though there were so many, the net was not torn. See, if you think about, if you remember this story, the story uh, in, the, uh, in the synoptics when the, they had this big catch of fish, I think it says that the, the catch, it was so great that the nets were breaking. Maybe this isn't the same story. Maybe this is a, uh, a similar instance, uh, but yet um, in this, as a post-resurrection appearance story, the nets didn't break and the fish were great in size. Maybe. All right. Uh, 153 of them. And there was then, though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Oh, yeah. Fish and, fish and, fish and bread for breakfast. Yum, yum. Okay. Now, uh, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. How did they know? It's that thing again. There's a motif where in these scriptures, when Jesus speaks and you have, uh, and you have a recognition, you have a realization, you, have, you actually let it in. You let his voice in that springs something inside of you. Oh, this is the Lord. It happened to Mary Magdalene also, right? Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread took the bread, gave it to them, did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So again, anytime we have taking and giving, eh, we don't see breaking, we don't see blessing, but we have a reminder of the Eucharist, right? This is a part of what we get whenever we see eating, especially in the Gospel of John. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Interesting, he felt hurt. Um, remember the three times that Paul, that, uh, that Peter had denied Christ, right? He did it three times, felt hurt. Now it says Peter felt hurt. 
How do you think Jesus felt when Peter denied him three times, even though he told him he was going to do it? It's an interesting thing because it means that Peter wasn't picking up on, oh, I see how this is going. I denied you three times, and now three times I'm going to... No, he wasn't picking up on that. This carries forth the theme that Peter's just a little bit dense. All right, we have it. That's said, okay? Peter felt hurt because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. <laughs> you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt to go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. So remember that this is a, uh, a he had said something like this, Jesus had some, said something like this earlier when he was talking about um, the way that the spirit goes, um, the spirit takes you where it will, um, and when sometimes when you're uh, old people, you just don't, you don't get to choose, you just get taken wherever people take you. Um, this is an illustration of um, being totally dependent, okay? Peter's job uh, from here forth is going to indicate that he is one who's going to have to follow the lead of Jesus, okay? We have a parenthetical expression here. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. Yes, he does, and eventually we do get uh, an account of uh, Peter's death, and um, of course he gets the tradition of being the first pope and all of that, but this is an example of Jesus reinstituting Peter into the fold because that was somewhat missing. It wouldn't have been necessary if it weren't for the fact that Peter in reality, does end up becoming a major force in the early church, especially in Palestine. And so this is his restitution, okay? This is Peter's, like, yes, Jesus is basically, yep, you did deny me three times. I asked you to feed my, we're good. We're good now. This is what we get. After this, he said to him, Follow me. Um, not a whole lot different from the way that miracle is described in the Synoptic Gospels, where from that point on, we have um, Peter uh, following him in his earthly ministry. Here, we have him in his resurrected ministry and Peter is now taking on, he's taking on a mantle of leadership. And it means nothing if he's not following Christ. And this is where, in the RC world, they get the, uh, the tradition of the, the Pope as being the vicar of Christ. And it's like, this is the presumption that that's what they're doing. Um, so that's our, our third Sunday of Easter, folks, um, for May 1st. Um, I hope that your uh, Easter tide is uh, continuing to experience resurrection and rebirth. Um, and until next time, peace.